Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our roundtable of today, hosted by Fabian Saldo Law Firm. I take the chance to say thank you to our managing partner, Mr. Stefano Bianchi, and uh, I also talk as president of the Thinking Water Mill Society, which is a nonprofit association which intends to share ideas on uh, social, economic, uh, and try to, to share this kind of, uh, uh, of ideas uh, with particular emphasis on the women condition. This is why today we are presenting the research uh, on the right of asylum from a gender perspective, trying to raise uh, awareness of the need for women and girls to be treated as a protected social group in the asylum determination process delineated within the 1951 Geneva Con Convention. So we are delighted and honored to have at our round table today, Ms. Patricia Scotland, Right Honorable, the Commonwealth Secretary General, and connected uh, with us, there are also uh, three of our researchers who have made all the study, who are uh, three Kenyan lawyers, Chatham Torridge, Kimberly Murray, and Mariangela Maina. Thank you very much for being with us. The round table will start with uh, Giovanni Carlo Bruno, who's a researcher, senior researcher of international law at the CNR, which is the National Research Council. Luis Gabriel Franceschi, who is the senior director of governance Peace at the Commonwealth, and he is also professor at the Strathmore University in Nairobi, Kenya. Then we will have an online um, Alan Mukuki, who is Director of International Partnership at the Strathmore University in Nairobi, Kenya. And last but not least, Chiara Scipioni, who is a member of the Refugee, Refugee Status Determination at UNCHR. And the moderator of all the roundtable will be Professor Fulvio, Fulvio Maria Palombino, who is a professor at the uh, Università degli Studi di Napoli uh, in International Law, Federico II, and also of Council of uh, Pavian Saldo Law Firm. And so I leave the floor to Honorable State General Mrs. Patricia Scotland, uh, who will uh, address the audience starting from a great initiative which is called Commonwealth Says No More, which brings together the Commonwealth Secretariat with the, with the purpose to prevent domestic and sexual violence. Thank you very much to all. Firstly, can I say what a huge honor and privilege it is to uh, be with you, albeit only virtually. And I want to thank Katrina and indeed uh, Pavia and, and Salado for inviting me and for enabling us to have this wonderful opportunity to come together to discuss some critical issues. As uh, Katrina said, I thought that might be helpful if we started this with just a taste of what we in the Commonwealth Secretariat have been doing. As many of you may know, the Commonwealth is made up of 54 countries from five different regions, and we represent about 2.6 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. You'll also know that violence against women and girls is one of the most pernicious evils that we have at the moment to deal with. And it is a silent pandemic. We've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but this silent pandemic has been killing and injuring more women and girls than any other single issue with which we have ever had to deal. And the Commonwealth have come together with the No More Foundation to address these issues. And I'm hoping that all of us on this call will help to do something about it. And I would like to start, if I may, with everyone's permission, 
with playing two relatively short videos. The first is a video which sets out why we are so passionate about this issue. And the second is one which asks us all to join the chorus. And I'm going to ask our very kind technician to play those short videos for you, just to contextualise perhaps some of the issues with which we will talk in a little while on this round table. Thank you. Violence against women and girls is a serious issue that affects one in three women around the world. Some places, the prevalence can even be higher and distressingly concerning. That violence is a pernicious blight on the ability of women and girls and children everywhere. It also takes a huge toll on children, families and communities. Amongst the consequences of measures implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic have been alarming rises in domestic and sexual violence. Women forced to isolate with an abusive partner. Sometimes we hear these names in the news, often when there's a tragic ending. Homes are no longer the safest place. COVID-19 is exacerbating a human travesty of women's rights. This cannot continue. It has to stop. For far too long, society has not done nearly enough. For too long, our society has not done enough to resist it. For far too long, we've been so quiet about violence against women. For too long, people have looked the other way. For too long, people have shamed the victim or said it's their fault. For too long, people have said, you must have done something to deserve it. For too long, people have said, it's a private matter. For too long, there is a shame attached to the experiences that stop women and girls from speaking up and getting help. There is never a time or circumstance where this societal evil is acceptable. That's why we are saying no more to such violence. My name is Shabana Azmi. Mohammed Bidi, Amina Justin Dumas, Ryan Johnson, Jerry Horner, Sir Rodney Williams, Nate Silawi, Wadia. I'm Helen Clark, and I'm pleased to lend my name to the Commonwealth's campaign to stop domestic and sexual violence in the Commonwealth. Today, as an initial step, we're unveiling a portal full of resources for anybody to see, as well as the first directory of gender race violence services throughout the Commonwealth. This is part of our wider Commonwealth Says No More campaign. Where you can access legal aid, seek help, hopefully eventually escape these horrible situations. Let us rise together, women and men, shifting attitudes and behavior and collectively saying no more. No more to domestic and sexual violence. No more shame. No more blame. No more to terror in our homes. No more excuses. No more deep service. We can and must do better. We will get this scourge in our society out and we will do the best that we can to make sure those women and children have a better future. Please join me in committing to speaking up. In taking the pledge at Commonwealth Says No More. You can do this by creating and sharing your own No More post. By joining together, we can bring the scourge of domestic and sexual violence to an end for good. For more information to take the pledge with me, you can visit commonwealthsaysnomore.org. that film because you will have seen a number of faces that you recognise. Helen Clark, of course, was the Prime Minister of New Zealand, also UNDP, Amina Mohammed, um, a number of our presidents. There was the president there of Antigua and Barbuda, the president of Kiribati. So the five regions are represented and we had parliamentarians, business people, actors, actresses, all of us. And basically the sign is that this will take everybody to participate in making the difference. And we are asking you to join the chorus. And this is this year's most recent pledge. 
and invitation. And I hope everyone on this call will think about how you will be able to join the chorus. And this is um, uh, Miss Twiggs, a really quite powerful voice for the new young people, and she's going to take it away. Home. It should be a space where we all feel safe. But for some, home can be a dangerous place with no escape. But while one voice might go unheard, a chorus cannot be ignored. Together, we can help free those harmed by domestic and sexual violence. Join the chorus and say, no more. Indulging me to that extent. Um, as I said earlier, it is a real privilege and a pleasure to be here with you today, delivering this keynote address for this important discussion, examining the right of asylum from a gender perspective. This event is happening at a critical time. We find ourselves living in a world in flux. We have felt the growing force of the global COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen an acceleration of global warming alongside a global increase in social unrest and increasing gaps between the rich and the poor, particularly accentuated by the recent vaccine inequality, which has been developing nations struggle to vaccinate their uh, populations as the rich poured inexplicably huge amounts of vaccine doses. And this has unfortunately lent credence to the growing disquiet about the resilience of the democratic institutions, which have formed the bedrock of our prosperity. The unravelling of society has exposed marginalised populations to the worst outcomes, meaning that in many communities, women and girls have borne the brunt of the recent challenges. The further destabilization of countries for various reasons, including war, ethnic, tribal, and religious violence, and climate change, amongst other issues, creates an intersectional dimension to the difficulties that women face when they are forced to seek asylum. The Commonwealth, being a voluntary association of 54 independent and equal countries spanning across advanced and developing economies, including many island nations, happens to be the home to 44% of the poorest women on the planet. Given that 1.2 billion of the world's women are in the Commonwealth, our charter speaks of gender equality and women's empowerment as being essential components of human development and basic human rights. However, in some societies, women and girls face violence and discrimination every day, simply because of their gender. And across the world, domestic and sexual violence has become a universal phenomenon of epidemic proportions. I would actually say of pandemic proportions. We've all heard the statistics. One in three women are likely to experience gender-based violence in their lifetime. If anything else was affecting one in three people, the world would have brought to a complete standstill and would have mobilized all actors and resources to put an end to it. Yet, we continue to see this violence largely regulated to the sidelines of the public safety agenda. And whilst female genital mutilation is becoming less common in some countries, at least 200 million girls and women alive today have been subjected to this form of violence. And less than 50% of working age women are in the labor market, a figure that has barely changed over the last quarter of a century. 
whilst 33,000 girls become child brides every day. That is one girl every two seconds. In times of displacement, these problems of gender inequality escalate, and the gendered intersection nature of women's oppression really comes to light. Globally, women and girls make up about 50% of refugees, internally displaced or stateless populations. But we know that in some cases, this figure can be much higher. In Syria, for instance, nearly 70% of the forcibly displaced population are women and girls. And these women, girls, particularly at the children, are those who suffer therefore the most. A chilling one in five women refugees experience sexual violence. And we know that these statistics are incomplete. These are just the women and girls who have reported abuse. And a lot more happens in the deadly silence of complicit homes and refugee camps. And many more are vulnerable to discrimination, harassment, trafficking, and other forms of exploitation and abuse. And women and girls are less likely to continue their education during times of crisis and are often forced to drop out of school or miss classes because household chores become a strain. According to the UNHCR, for every 10 refugee boys in primary school, there are fewer than eight refugee girls. And this number drops again for secondary school, where boys outnumber girls 10 to 7. The climate is changing, and it won't wait. This is the defining crisis of our time. And the impacts of climate change are unevenly weighted against the world's most vulnerable. The Australian Institute of Economics and Peace predicts that at least 1.2 billion people could be displaced by climate-related events by 2050. We know that heat waves, droughts, rising sea levels and extreme storms disproportionately affect women. And according to the UN, four in five people displaced by climate change globally are women. Women are more likely than men to hold jobs vulnerable to climate change and less able than men to turn to alternative forms of work. And women are more likely to live in poverty than men, have less access to basic human rights, like the ability to freely move, and acquire land and face systemic violence and escalates during periods of instability. And we know that the reasons why migrant, refugee and asylum seeking women leave their countries of origin are as diverse as their nationality, age, legal and social statuses. Tonight, I have barely skimmed the surface of challenges women and girls once displaced face. What is clear is that despite the standards established to protect these women, the measures put in place are often inadequate or do not meet their protection and integration needs. And this can only be addressed through gender sensitive migration and asylum policies, including specific protection and support mechanisms. And as we know, and as will be discussed throughout the event this evening, the universal instruments governing the international protection of refugees, the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol, do not refer to sex or gender in the refugee definition. Whilst the 1951 Convention does not explicitly recognise women as a protected social group, women fleeing gender-based discrimination can seek asylum based on the criteria 
membership in a particular social group. It is widely recognised that the definition of refugee should take into account the particular harm or persecution women may experience. However, we've seen time and time again, countries are often reluctant to recognise women as a protected social group, instead preferring to define cases based upon the other criteria listed in the 1951 Convention. And the burden of proof falls upon the victim. This is not always easy for women and girls to meet, and it's often left up to the discretion of judges. Why, given all we know, are acts of violence against women not expressly covered, both in law or consistently in practice? The question remains, how do we change the paradigm to create a safer, stronger world? The past century has witnessed the greatest advances for gender equality in human history. From New Zealand becoming the first self-governing country in 1893 to allow women to vote in parliamentary elections, to Sri Lanka electing the world's first female prime minister in 1960. The gender gap has never narrowed so quickly. However, there is still much ground to be gained for a girl born today to be equal and on an equal footing with a boy. To start, all of us must join the chorus by playing our part to both prevent violence from happening in the first place and providing necessary support for those who will experience it. A world without violence is possible but it involves all of us taking action, just as we are doing to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. When it comes to climate change, we no longer have any excuse not to act. We already have a blueprint for international cooperation in the form of the Paris Agreement, which makes specific provision for the empowerment of women. What's more, emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a critical window to set a new path and build back better. You can be sure that I will be reinforcing this message to all our world leaders during COP26, which will take place in Glasgow next month. This event this evening is an important opportunity for us to take stock it opens a discussion, given all we know. Does the current framework still make sense? We have brilliant minds in this room with us tonight, and I can't wait to tackle this problem together. As I've always said, if not now, then when? If not us, then who? This is the issue for our generation of jurists. The 1945 generation of jurists gave us the Bretton Woods and the UN and other institutions which we now applaud. Our challenge is a new one. It's a different one. It's a difficult one. But it's one where I believe our generation of jurists have the capacity to be the difference that we need to make in the world. We were talking earlier about what makes a good lawyer. What makes a good lawyer, in my eyes, is courage. We need courage, not just acuity and knowledge and understanding. We need the courage to choose to be the difference and craft a new way forward which will really deliver peace and justice and fairness for all the people about whom we care. And I am thanking you all, not just for what you've done until today, 
and what we will discuss today, but I'm thanking you in advance to what I know we will together do to make our future significantly different than our past. So thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Secretary General. And I leave the floor now to our three researchers. And I forgot to say before that this roundtable is being recorded. So it might be seen also afterwards in the, in the future. And so, as I said before, I leave the floor to our three researchers who have done uh, this beautiful work. Kimberly Chapton and Maria Angela. Thank you. The Secretary General of the Commonwealth, the Senior Director of the Commonwealth, all esteemed invited guests, good evening. My name is Kimberly Murethi and I'm joined by my co-authors, Maria Angela Maina and Cheptum Toreitich. We are the authors of the article, The Right to Asylum from a Gender Perspective. Our article, the main publication that was circulated features a series of five articles, all based on the right to asylum from a gender perspective. The first article, which is based on human rights, traces the origin of human rights and the connection between human rights and refugee law, as it is well known and as it is well decided that the basis of refugee law is in human rights. It also traces the history and the development of human rights, as well as its codification in the human rights statutes, conventions, and documents. Our second article, Women's Rights, discusses issues of gender, gender equality, and this is where we make the case for women's rights as human rights, which was elaborated on by the Right Honorable Baroness Patricia Scotland. Our third article goes on to trace the history of refugee law. This is particularly important when we go into the refugee law documents and conventions to then make our case for the right of asylum from a gender perspective. In the historical background of refugee law, we start all the way from 740 BC before Christ in the Assyrian conquest to the Armenian genocide, then to World War II, and now to the current Rohingya crisis and the current refugee crisis grappling the world. Our fourth article goes into asylum law and the procedural elements for asylum law. Here, we discuss the right to asylum. We define terms such as what is a migrant, what is a refugee, and who is an asylum seeker. We also provide the legal framework for asylum law. And then we go into what is the procedure for asylum application and the requirements to obtain refugee status. Here is where we begin our main article and discuss gender as a protected social group in the asylum determination process. And then many people have asked us, why did we decide to do this article? What made us feel that we should articulate our views on this matter? As many speakers may know, or as most of you may know, we all come from Kenya, which is home to one of the largest, if not the largest refugee camp in the world, which is Kakuma. We also feel a very deep connection to refugees and particularly to African women as the three of us are all African women born and raised in Kenya. Now we go into what is the problem? What problem have we identified in our research? Our problem as briefly touched on by the Baroness is the non-recognition of gender as a protected social group in the 1951 Refugee Convention. To put it simply, one cannot explicitly rely on gender as a ground for seeking asylum. So many people ask, why is this a critical issue? So as one cannot explicitly rely on gender-based gender as a protected social group, there are various issues that come up when we discuss the context of gender. And this is particularly gender-based violence. So this has been defined by the UN as physical, verbal, and emotional harassment or emotional violence that occurs to women as or as because of their gender. So this can also be defined as intimate partner violence, child marriage, female genital mutilation, 
trafficking for sexual exploitation, female inter infanticide and honor crimes. So in our presentation, we go into some considerations which would be important. The first consideration is what definition of gender were we working with? According to us, we define gender as a socially constructed role, behavior, expression, and identity of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. So here we look at gender from the perspective of a socially construed role and not from the perspective of sex, which is often linked to the biological. So we also defined sex as biological attributes of humans and animals, including physical features, chromosomes, gene expression, hormones, and anatomy. So this is very important to understand the different views on what constitutes gender and what constitutes sex. This has also been defined under the World Health Organization definition. So going directly into our article on human rights and women's rights, which was the first article. Today, women's rights and gender equality exists on paper, but not in real life. So here we have statements like women's rights are not human rights, or we am a humanist and not a feminist, or I believe in human rights, but not in categorically women's rights. So there's a famous quote by Emma Chesen, which says, the mix of social norms, laws, and policies are interlinked, leading to the gender inequality phenomenon. So this also takes us back to the world famous quote by Simone de Beauvoir, who classifies women as the other gender arising from the treatment of women throughout history and makes the case for the famous statement, women are not born, but rather made women. So women and girls often, when we discuss the issue of human rights, are classified as a minority or a vulnerable group. The other gender, as I briefly touched on, um, going into Simone de Beauvoir's works, has been attributed to the systematic discrimination and subordination of women due to their status as women. So this is what led to even the 1951 convention where in the general comment it was written that they did not even merely consider that gender could be a basis for persecution. Furthermore, the recognition on, of protection of all women's rights does matter. And we categorically state, according to us, human rights are indeed women's rights. For example, if we were to look at female genital mutilation, there are increasing rates of female asylum seekers who have flown to the European Union. And this is simply because the European Union recognizes the plight of women across the globe and caters for these women in asylum camps, as well as in their refugee policy documents and their national documents. So just to categorize or to show how many women asylum seekers are coming to Europe from around the world. This is a very, very large number. We have around 20,000 women and girls seeking asylum just arising from FGM. So this is particularly important as FGM is not recognized as it falls within gender-based violence, which is not recognized under the 1951 convention as gender is not recognized as a particular social group. We further sought to analyze the problem. So here we dealt with the current legal framework for refugee law. And here I invite Cheptum Toretich to take on. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. 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 Good evening. Uh, apologies, my camera isn't working because I'm accessing the program via my web browser. Right now, I'm going to take you through the current framework which governs the refugee uh, policies and laws as we know it. We are governed by the 1951 Geneva Convention as well as the 1967 protocol, which gives further guidance to the convention. Other than the international framework, each region has its own framework with regards to refugee law, and each country or nation state has its own um, governing framework with regards to how they deal with refugees. Firstly, we need to understand there's a difference between a refugee 
a migrant and an asylum seeker. In this context, we need to distinguish between an asylum seeker and a refugee. A refugee was once an asylum seeker. And our discussion for today is to see how to have gender incorporated in the asylum seeking process. I'm going to take us through an analysis of the current problem and we must look at the law to understand who a refugee is. Firstly, the person seeking asylum should one, have a well-founded fear of persecution, must have faced persecution because of their race, religion, their political opinion, nationality, or their membership to a particular social group. And thirdly, he or she must be outside their country of nationality and is unable or owing to such fear and willing to, to avail himself of the protection of that country. From these three grounds, we can see that gender or end gender-based persecution is not a potential ground for seeking asylum. It's not explicitly nor expressly provided for as a protected social group under the 1951 convention. Further, during the asylum seeking process, women, have, women must go through a very scrutinized uh, procedure to prove that they are a particular social group. That's a current framework women are being used. That's a current framework women are using to grant to be granted asylum under the convention. The problem with this practice is that it's subject to case by case interpretation, and there's no standard rule governing gender based persecution for these women. An example is the famous case in the United States, known as in the matter of AB, where the AG directed that there must be a very high standard burden of proof for the woman asylum seeker who was facing gender-based violence in her home. Unfortunately, the judge said that the issue was a private matter because it was, domestic, it was a domestic violence issue. During the application and review process, um, women suffer increased stressors during the process. The issue is the asylum seeking process takes a lot of time and this particular person faces, sometimes faces further violence in the camps because of food insecurity, separation from family, social stigma, stigmatization and homelessness. So now we'll move on to how our recommended solution to this particular problem. So in conclusion, we recommend that there should be a huge change or there should be a reform to the 1951 convention, explicitly and not impliedly providing for gender as a particular social group. So this is because there's an existence of what is often termed as procedural barriers. So procedural barriers are the barriers touched on by Chepchum Tore Teach which includes stressors in the application process and the fact that women have to go through the partic a particular social group in order to define that they do indeed fall under membership of a particular social group so as to obtain protection under the 1951 convention. Furthermore, this reform of the convention would be allowing one to seek asylum from on the basis of gender. We also call for a look or a critical analysis into the burden of proof women often face when lodging their applications in the asylum determination process or in the refugee determination process. We also call for the appreciation and the legal recognition of the nexus between gender and persecution. This includes recognizing that gender and persecution are indeed tied and they should be recognized. Furthermore, we close by calling for the recognition of the challenges women asylum seekers face and refugees face simply because they are women. This includes the stressors touched on briefly by Cheptun Toritich. All this has been articulated in our article and in our publication, which we invite all honorable guests and members 
to read, share, and advocate for. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Um, Maria sends her regards. She was unable to connect through audio. We hope it has been a good presentation. Thank you. Okay. So good evening, everyone. First of all, uh, let me uh, thank Katerina and Mario for involving me uh, in this uh, splendid initiative and for giving me the opportunity of moderating this round table. Uh, well, uh, as you already know from the program, uh, over the next few minutes, uh, we will try to discuss uh, the topic uh, of the today's event uh, with four unquestionable experts on uh, uh, the matter. As already mentioned by Katrina, I'm talking about uh, uh, Giovanni Carlo Bruno, Luis Gabriel uh, Franceschi, uh, Alan Mukuki, and Chiara uh, Scipioni. Uh, as a matter of practice, this is just for uh, speakers, the slot at your disposal is 10 minutes, more or less, at the maximum, let's say, <laughs> maybe it's better, so as to have some time for uh, a short debate uh, in case and to allow me to draw some final concluding remarks. Uh, well, uh, that's it as a matter of uh, premise and uh, without further ado, I'm very glad uh, to introduce our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Giovanni Carlo Bruno. Giancarlo is a uh, senior researcher uh, of international law at the Italian uh, National Research Council. So Giancarlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fulvio. And good evening to all participants uh, online uh, and uh, here in this room. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, to, first of all, to the organizers. Fabien uh, Ansaldo Law Firm, the Thinking Waterloo Society, Caterina and Mario and Fulvio. And let me uh, first say, I'll start by quoting, if I may, the Honorable uh, Secretary General of Scotland. Uh, with her invitation, she said, if not now, then when? If not us, then who? And I, I try to, to build upon this invitation my short intervention, and uh, because my point of view is a bit, I would say, active to this uh, gender-specific uh, perspective as such, because uh, I, I will not touch the definition of a particular social group to encompass gender, because I, I'm sure that my colleague from the UNHCR will touch on this uh, and uh, develop uh, uh, hints and suggestions on this subject. But I would focus on uh, vulnerable groups in general and on inequalities in general. Why? Because, uh, very shortly, in a very recent judgment of the Court of Cassation of Italy uh, last uh, November, November 2020, on a case concerning the denial of international, of international protection, that is subsidiary humanitarian protection, for the so-called climatic refugees, and we could discuss on this already. Uh, anyway, in that case, the Court of Cassazione, the Court of Cassation said that for granting a residence permit for humanitarian reasons, the applicant's condition of vulnerability must be verified on a case-by-case -case basis. That, that's the issue. I mean, so if an individual assessment that could be the private life in Italy, the private life in the country of origin, what the applicant would be exposed with his personal uh, uh, history if, in case of repatriation, not to say the possibility of using the standards already existed in Europe, in Italy, since the Court of Cassation is the maximum court in Italy, the standards from the European Convention on Human Rights. So I would say that this constitutive nucleus of personal dignity is, regardless of any 
perspective other than humans. So this would encompass all dimensions. And in the, in the case of the exam, it played the role of including climatic conditions and the fundamental right to health and so and the fundamental right to find a place for a dig, uh, dignified living. That's the first example. The second, on inequalities. In, in a recent analysis of the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, it was found out that there is, a, I would say, an opposition between vulnerable women or women, girl or girls, mother or mothers, but on the other side, there are vulnerable persons, situation, groups, individuals, members, people, prisoners, victims, children, patients, families, social groups, old people, communities, employees, youth. Are we sure that if we focus too much or only on the case of the gender in the sense of including a gender perspective can lead to a result of, I'd say, give a better protection to all vulnerable groups. I'm doubtful about that. I don't have an answer, and I think that this occasion, which, if I may say, is the first after the outbreak of the pandemic crisis that offers me the possibility of discussing around the table with also with online participants, but also around the table with, with, uh, with colleagues and uh, other um, participants. Are we sure that a narrow definition, if you allow me to say so, uh, of gender, so any rule referring to women as a particular social group is really giving an advantage to all vulnerable groups having a weaker protection. In, in the title of, the, of this afternoon uh, intervention, I still have four minutes, so <laughs> I, you, you try to suggest, uh, I, I know you well, <laughs> Uh, you try to suggest that uh, a modification of existing convention could be a viable solution. I'm rather doubtful about that because, first of all, to modify a convention is a heavy formal process. Then uh, inequalities uh, are so huge among the community of states uh, that to find out uh, a minimum standard of agreement would be a result that would be very low, in my opinion. Then there is a question of lengthy of procedures for a formal amendment. And lastly, the conclusion of the amendment procedure leading to a new treaty would need ratifications. So can, can you imagine how many years would it take to, to get a real impact on this problem? So that's one question was raised by Honorable Miss Scotland. If not now, then when? In my opinion, I prefer not to move too far. I don't want, I, I would like to have a, a viable solution at present or at least in few years. So I would say that we have in our hands a possibility. The large use of domestic remedies and the contribution of legal practitioners, a, a category encompassing lawyers, judges, experts, and even academics, in my opinion, it seems a, a more meaningful response to the needs expressed during this meeting. I learned uh, a lot from your presentation on violence against women. I learned a lot from the consideration done by our colleagues uh, working for the foundations. So 
I would say what simply was said by uh, important professors of international law in Italy, that the, the role of the national interpreter of international law to guarantee the harmonization of the external rule to the needs of each society is not only very catchy, but should, be to a, should bring to a more balanced approach to all gender issues. To wrap up and to conclude, the case by case analysis may add more at present while preparing, I would say, the flow to a larger legal consideration of the issue. <laughs> so let's use what we do have now. We do have lots of people dealing with this issue who are ready to contribute. So I try to answer to your second invitation, if not us, then who? I think not around, not only around this table, but also elsewhere, there are lots of people ready to do that and to help in rebalancing the existing gap and then preparing the path for a more, a larger protected social group uh, aim in the also in the convention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Giancarlo, for this in, uh, inspiring presentation. And now uh, let me uh, give the floor to our next speaker, Luis Gabriel Franceschi. Uh, Luis is uh, Commonwealth uh, Senior Director of Governance and Peace and uh, Founding Dean of the Strathmore University Law School, where he's also a professor. So Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Fulvio. Uh, thank you, Giovanni, for those reflections. Secretary General, I think you have provided the punchline for us. Uh, and I would like to take what you said just before, uh, if not now, when, if not us, who. Uh, you said we have brilliant legal minds in the room with us tonight, and I can't wait to tackle this problem together. And I think this responds the dilemma uh, Giovanni has put across. How do we handle a convention that has lost touch with reality, that seems to have to be either, as Fulvio put it, changed or uh, expanded? And I know we are all reluctant, well, the international order is reluctant to change. When we see a concept, we get stuck to it and we realize that, well, it's very difficult and it takes a huge effort uh, in multilateral negotiations to change anything that has to do with established concepts like asylum and the extent to which asylum can be applied. However, we see many injustices happening in today's world and perhaps we are trying to repair those injustices, indifference or discrimination by changing the, the name, by changing the medicine from Panadol to Piritol or to Aspirin, instead of looking at what is causing the fever. Uh, they are incredible, as uh, the Secretary General likes saying, she said this morning in a, a, in a speech, by when she said, we are in the same storm, but not on the same boat. And it's true, there are huge differences. So we are telling, we are trying to repair social differences, discrimination and damage that have been caused by the social gap, perhaps with the means of something that was created for something else. It, of course, that has to be adapted to the times, but has remained in the past. And of course, to, to run away from that responsibility authorities tend to quote the 1951, the 1949, the 1964 conventions, and we get stuck in the past instead of looking to the future. There is something that struck me when I learned about it 
women who were on hunger strike in 2018 at Yards Wood Immigration Removal Center said, and I quote this, it is true that women have made much progress in the past 20th, in the past century since the suffrage, suffragettes won the right for the women to vote, but a hundred years does not negate an entire history of women being treated as best at best as inferior and at worst as property. We have a long way to go. And they said that while they were in hunger strike in one of the most developed countries in the world, the UK, which has 10 detention centers for women who have applied for asylum. And what is even more striking, these women are treated as prisoners. They have no freedom. And even more striking are prisoners with no right to bail because the, the period is not established and you can spend a long time in that place without any right to get out of there. So you say, well, what's happening? What, do, what can we do? Well, there is a problem. To qualify for recognition as a refugee, as it was said, and the research is fantastically done, Claimants must demonstrate that they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted. Of course, when this was drafted, being persecuted meant something. And today, being persecuted means a lot more. Because nowadays, for example, we do not have just political persecution. But I am sure that there are many women and girls who wish they were politically persecuted but not being persecuted by a husband who is a, 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 a madman, or by a cousin or by an uncle who is abusing them sexually. Today, sadly, we had a case in Kenya of the young girl who held the world record on athletics who was, who was killed, was murdered by the partner or the husband, I don't know who, but she was stabbed to death and she was found dead in the house. And you say, well, hey, and this woman could run fast. So that man managed to kill an athletic woman who had the record, uh, a world record in racing and, and kill her. So this, is, this shows you the seriousness of the abuses people are going through. Does this qualify as being persecuted? Well, according to authorities, it doesn't, but, well, it seems it should, and we have to shift. Also, there are many people who have been persecuted uh, through cyber means. Means there are people who have had to move location, country, because of being persecuted through social media. So much so that whenever they were identified in a shop, in the street, anywhere, they would be bullied. And of course, that is a, a, a shocking reality. Then what happens when you are a man, perhaps you can deal with that persecution physically. Okay? Anyone who tries to come to you, you can box the person, the law, the jungle, the stronger. But hey, not many people can respond. Not all men can respond like that, let alone many women. So we have to evaluate the law to see that it reflects the broad way that may render women refugees. The ways to look into persecution are different for either gender and evaluate the procedural systems that are inherent to the asylum seeking process. Well, the implied catch of disbelief. You are uh, uh, seeking asylum, you are a liar unless we prove that, well, it is true. It is something that is... Something that I wanted to touch upon is that, well, gender has unfortunately been overlooked in the dominant interpretation of the 1951 Convention, because unlike other aspects of difference, including race, religion, and nationality, it is not listed as one of the enumerated convention grounds that can form the basis of a claim for protection under international law that was mentioned in the research. Well, the experiences of women may offer 
differ significantly from those of men because women political protests, activism, resistance, and social reality are different. What happens? These conventions, let's face it, were written by men and reflecting the situation of a time when men were the political actors. When I look at the photographs in the rain room in Marlboro House, that is the palace where the Commonwealth sits, and you see the photographs of Chogam, that is the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings, all the presidents, 54 countries, presidents meet, or prime ministers meet there and discuss, and you look at the photographs across all the years, it's every two years, they were all men. There was one woman, since 1953 was the, the queen, okay, and she has been there all these years. Uh, but they were all men, with an exception, suddenly. Oh, that uh, uh, incidentally an Italian who was prime minister of India, and then he popped up there in Viragandhi, and then the other one popped in here, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, here and there. But very few and far in between. So we are dealing or complaining about gender discrimination by laws that were written by men for a time and a reality and a historical context that has changed. So very quickly to, well, and again, women political participation has been traditionally different. For example, in the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, women participated mostly by passing messages. They were the message keepers and the information keepers. Uh, women may hide people. It happened a lot in the Second World War, World War uh, pass messages, provide community services, food, clothing, medical care, etc. Then, what do we need to do? To evaluate the law and see that in its application it reflects the broad ways that may render ref women refugees. We have to find innovative ways of doing this, perhaps through jurisprudence, in common law, it would be easier to change the convention or rather to adapt the convention to the modern times as a living document closely tied to this, looking to ways that persecution may manifest different, in different ways for different genders. And third, evaluate the procedural systems. So that this implied culture of disbelief that works against people that do not have a common cause for invoking the right of asylum because they are invoking it for different reasons that also obey a violent necessity to run away from your country of origin. Thank you very much. I hope that helps to clarify a few issues. And thank you the researchers who have done a fantastic job and practically everything I said with a few plus or minuses uh, is it's contained in those papers. Thank you very much, Luis, for your uh, contribution. Uh, our next speaker is Alan Kuki. Alan is Director and Professor of International Partnerships at the Strathmore University Law School. Uh, Alan, are you there? Ah, okay. Good yes, day. I am. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. And usually here in Kenya, we see all protocols observed. Thank you for uh, having me at this conference or seminar that you've done. I must say it's a bit unfair to have me speak after my mentor, <laughs> and but uh, I hope that I will live up to what even my former students, Cheptum, Timbali, and Maria Angela have um, have submitted, um, especially with the book which deals with interesting aspects, um, which I also try to cover in my research in the PhD. I'm going to speak briefly on the issue of FGM and um, the Right Honourable Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Uh, Right Honourable Patricia Scotland spoke about this and she mentioned about the millions of women out there suffering from the problem of FGM and running away from this. And my main focus is on the East African region and in particular Uganda. This is uh, unique and peculiar in a way because um, the Pokot women in Uganda, um, almost 80% of them have to undergo the concept of FGM. and the second reason why I have chosen Uganda, also because it's a part of my study in my PhD, is because it has a, 
particular provision in its refugee law as a country that provides for the protection of women, um, especially, it, 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 let me read it out for you. It says, a person qualifies to be granted refugee status under the Refugee Act owing to a well-founded fear of persecution for failing to conform to gender discriminating practices. And, and that involves um, FGM as well. Um, so this is interesting because back in 2009, the, United, the uh, UNHCR, through the guidance notes on refugee claims on FGM, did indicate that um, if a woman or a lady or a girl has undergone FGM issues, um, if they have experienced the um, FGM is categorized as torture, or violence to that extent, it can be physical or psychological in nature. You find that the UNHCR tries to, instead of, and, and uh, Kimberly mentioned it, the aspect of recognizing women under the 1951 Refugee Convention is very critical because some of these gender discriminating practices have not been um, highlighted in the convention. And um, it is my view that they should be highlighted and um, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth alluded to this aspect as well as Kimberly uh, in her presentation. And some of these forms of violence and torture include harmful practices like FGM. And because the, tra and, and, and Professor Franceschi has just mentioned that the convention having begun its journey in 1933, found its way in 1951 in a Eurocentric manner, uh, because at that time the world wars had just ended and Europe had an outflow of refugees. And at that time the convention was created and later on it necessitated the removal of boundaries in 1977 in the protocol that would allow now people from outside Europe also to be considered as refugees. So as you can see, is it time to say that the 1951 refugee convention has been passed by time? because all we do is patch and paste here and there to try cover each and every person. And then and, and the UNHCR actually indicates that people who undergo FGM practices would be considered under Article 1A2 of the 1951 Refugee Convention as members of a particular social group. Now, this is just lumping them together with everyone else and saying, if you go through something, you're just a member of a particular social group and you can be considered that. I think it's unfair to use a, a loose term there and we should have practices like FGM criminalized and also to be given a right to be protected under refugee status. It's interesting when you look at the aspect of FGM, because sadly, um, in my home country in Kenya, we have law that the anti-FGM act, and there are four types of FGM, um, if I may mention them, the partial or total removal of the clitoris or the preputans, partial or total removal of the labia minora, narrowing of the vagina orifice. Now there's a fourth aspect, which is all other harmful procedures to the female genitalia for non-medical purposes. For example, pricking, piercing, incising, scraping, or cauterization. Now this is still legal in Kenya. The fourth type four FGM is still legal in Kenya. The act has not criminalized this. And, and a recent case in the High Court of Kenya indicated that this should also be amended so that women are protected all around and all forms of FGM should be criminalized. Now, as you can see, my country is a bit backward compared to Uganda, which protects women um, against FGM and accords them refugee status. In the long run, as a durable solution to all this and to follow in the footsteps of Uganda, is that there should be one, a recognition of practices like harmful practices like FGM in the Refugee Convention, which definitely I'm a proponent of it to be amended to include current practices that have been left out. We are no longer at war. Now we are dealing with um, new issues, new areas of refugee law. And FGM should be considered as a criteria for refugee status de determination on the submission of categories under women and children. As Kimberly had mentioned, the aspect of trying to ensure that women are also protected under the Refugee Convention. And this applies to survivors of victims uh, or victims of torture, because FGM itself is torture um, for all purposes and intent. In conclusion, Watson Shire, a Kenyan who moved, a Kenyan born to Somali parents and moved to the UK, has a poem called Home. 
And she says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And there's a line, a paragraph, a subparagraph that I would want to conclude with. Where she says, I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is a barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Eggs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. With these words, let's think about women and girls who go through FGM. If we do not protect them, then who else will protect them? And as the in closing remarks, as the Secretary General said, if not now, then when? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alan, for your presentation. Well, last but not least, I'm glad to give the floor to Chiara Scipioni. Chiara uh, is a RSD, Refugee Status Determination Associate, at the uh, UN Agency for Refugees. So, Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Thinking Water Mill Society for organizing the roundtable and to the Fabian Ansaldo Law Firm for hosting us. And thank you also to the brilliant uh, speakers before me for you know these inspiring inputs that you gave me. So I'm pleased to be to be here to give a personal contribution to this very interesting and absolutely sensitive and important issue, such the right to asylum from a gender perspective is. As mentioned, I currently represent UNHCR in the government Italian procedure uh, of the Ministry of Interior. So I think I, you know, sit in a kind of privileged observatory because every day I assist to interviews and decisions on um, claims of asylum seekers. So I will try to really briefly present some data on women in the asylum system, in the Italian asylum system in 2020 and uh, even try to summarize some of the main referral pathways that are in place in the Italian asylum system for gender-based violence and trafficking survivors. But just, I would like to, to start just with some consideration as a starting point. There is no doubt that international human rights instruments were developed and you know, for a long time, continued to be interpreted from the perspective of male experience, as already mentioned. And this reality was also reflected in the international asylum system, which initially was also large, which initially also largely interpreted the Geneva Convention definition of refugee from the male experience of persecution, sometimes failing to provide effective protection to women asylum seekers. Among the factors distinguish women's gender-based asylum claims from persecution and claims typically made by men, there are two myths. The first one is that of the public-private separation, according to which being violations against women usually put in place by individual actors rather than state actors and in the private sphere at home or inside the community, then they were private matters, not considered and not subject to international scrutiny, and in most cases, not subject to national scrutiny either. So forced marriage, uh, domestic violence, rape, honor crimes, uh, are only some examples of human rights violations considered to take place in this private sphere. The second myth was that women's human rights uh, were not to be held as firmly as those of men, but could be subject to different application and interpretation as dictated by the higher demands of male culture and tradition. So in addition to these two you know, main myths, other factors have kept gender-based violence claims um, cases um, from being recognized Including, including the fact that women are often persecuted differently than men, often through gender-based violence. And moreover, this is often, often accompanied by a lack of state protection, as mentioned, rather than active uh, persecution by the state. And finally, some women may, uh, you know, could lack sufficient uh, legal and political awareness to articulate 
their experiences in the language of human rights, persecution, or the larger context of systemic gender inequalities. Nonetheless, over the last 30 years, significant measures have been taken by actors in the human rights and refugee field, as well as many governments, to ensure that interpretation of relevant international instruments, including the 1951 Geneva Convention definition and related procedures, are fair, gender sensitive and inclusive. The protection of women and girls of concern is a core activity and an, organization pri an organizational priority for UNHCR. Uh, members of the UNHCR Executive Committee has specifically recognized the need to devote attention and resources to the protection of women and girls starting from 1985. They later reaffirmed this in the Agenda for Protection in 2002 through goal number six that was meeting the protection needs of refugee women and children and in the same 2002 through UNHCR guidelines number one, the, the guidelines on gender-related claims. Let me just underline that yes, the, uh, many speakers proposed um, you know, the, the uh, amendment of the Geneva Convention, of course, I'm not the one to say anything about this, but um, UNHCR in, intervened and issued a number of guidelines that are legal instruments provided to states, to government and to asylum authorities for, you know, the authentic interpretation of Geneva Convention. And the very first of these guidelines, guidelines number one, were those issued in 2002 related to gender-related claims. So uh, after this, I could mention the guidelines number two about the particular social group, the number seven about trafficking in human beings as a violation, the number nine on um, uh, claims submitted, submitted by persons with a diverse uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. So these are the legal instruments currently at disposal to governments and asylum authorities. So in these guidelines, uh, UNHCR clearly underlined the importance of systematically applying a gender analysis to the interpretation of Geneva Convention, also proposing to states and to asylum authorities some procedural practices in order to ensure that proper consideration is given to women claimants in refugee status determination procedure and that the range of gender-related claims are recognized as such. UNHCR guidelines also recall the importance of considering the intersecting factors that already mentioned before that may contribute to and compound the effect of violence and discrimination that includes sex, gender, uh, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, and any other personal characteristic that can represent a layer to, uh, of discrimination. If we briefly focus on data of women in the asylum procedure and their claims, we will notice how intersecting inequality affect uh, women's lives. The data we share are those officially provided by the uh, European agency Eurostat. And in 2020, about 20% 20 of Italian asylum applications have been submitted by women. So 20% of both um, subsequent and new applications have been sub submitted by women. The main countries of origin of women asylum seekers included Georgia, Ukraine, Côte d'Ivoire, Albania, Nigeria, Syria, and Somalia. When we come to Central and South Africa, uh, South, sorry, South America as country of origin, the numbers of women applicants significantly grow up, with women representing about the 50% of the total amount of asylum seekers coming from uh, these countries, and more specifically Venezuela, Colombia, El Salvador, and Peru. But as regards recognition rate, women in Italy represented the majority of recognized refugees. The 52% of recognized refugees based on Article 1A of Geneva Convention and the 40% of all asylum seekers in need of international protection, I mean, putting together refugee status and subsidiary protections. 
briefly about profiles and claims women asylum seekers in Italy are generally gender-based violence survivors who suffer trafficking in human beings, domestic violence, female genital mutilation, forced marriages, both in countries of origin and in transit countries. Uh, during the last two years, we observed an increase in the number of Ivorian women uh, identified as trafficking and gender-based violence survivors both in transit and in Libya mainly, mainly and in Tunisia, but also in their country of origin. We also observed a higher number of women coming from Central and South America with trafficking indicators, gender-based violence survivors, so women at risk of suffering gender-based violence uh, and domestic violence upon return coming from Venezuela, El Salvador and Peru. We also observed and recognized a number of transgender women as, you know, in need of international protection, mostly coming from Brazil, Colombia, but they're often identified as survivors of trafficking for forced prostitution and based on individual circumstances, transgender refugee women are, can be at risk of re-trafficking or at risk of suffering persecution based on their gender identity. So based on the clear impact that in Italy at least gender-based violence has on women asylum seekers, starting from 2016, UNHCR promoted the adoption of national guidelines for the identification of potential victims of trafficking in the context of uh, asylum procedures, because promoting the uh, complementarity and cooperation between the asylum system and the specific services for the protection of survivors of trafficking in human beings, as well as promoting effective referral mechanism between the two protection frameworks is of utmost importance. So victims of human trafficking must be protected, of course, from further harm. And they must be enabled to fully enjoy the vast range of rights that the Italian system foresees to them. So thanks to these efforts, for example, between 2018 and 2020, more than 10,400 potential victims of trafficking have been referred by the Italian local authorities, asylum authorities, to anti-trafficking bodies. And in the meantime, the formal coordination and cooperation between the two systems has been reinforced and on the basis of the experience gained in the field of identification of trafficking survivors. Now also standard operating procedures on referral of more generally, let me say, gender-based violence survivors in the context of the RSD procedure are going to be published together by UNHCR and the National Asylum Authority. So, just let me conclude my intervention, just uh, you know, adding and underlining that despite all these challenges, uh, women and girls and asylum seekers and refugees show great resilience, uh, resourcefulness and courage in adapting to and surmounting these problems. They need to often become victims of serious human rights violations, but they are also strong survivors whose active participation and empowerment we have to support and secure if we are to protect their rights and those of their communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara, for your contribution. I think we have uh, five, six minutes uh, for a couple of uh, questions. Of course, the debate is open also so to everyone. So I don't know whether there, there is any questions by remote? Of course, also the other speakers. <laughs> I, I think we would like to. No, no, I, I, I refrain from doing this because I think all, all the interviewers may, may have. Uh, we do have some extra time after the, the conference for these changing ideas, and I think everybody really gave its. Uh, opinion which is a richness uh, for all uh, so I'm curious to hear okay no questions well okay the time has come to try to uh, draw some final conclusions I will try to be as much brief as possible 
uh, one hour should be enough. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Okay, so needless to say, uh, also having in mind the Thinking Water Mill Society report, which has been presented today, the absence of uh, explicit gender-based uh, provisions in most of the international conventions concerning the protection of fundamental rights is problematic as a matter of principle. And of course, the amendment and uh, modification of those uh, treaties uh, would, rep would represent the most uh, appropriate solution. Uh, yet, this is nothing but a simple, as already uh, said by uh, Giancarlo and by Lewis as well, and the reason I'm not hard to grasp. First of all, from a, a strictly technical point of view, the amendment and modification procedure provided for by the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties is quite complex. Secondly, and most importantly, and this is a specific point which uh, emerged uh, in the presentation by Lewis, states are uh, always uh, reluctant to give up uh, on portions of their sovereignty and introducing uh, an explicit uh, gender parameter in those conventions would, of course, uh, produce an effect of this kind. Um, on the other hand, this uh, circumstance, or the absence of explicit gender-based provision in international treaties, or in most international treaties, uh, must not be uh, overemphasized, uh, since as lawyers, uh, and as uh, several times uh, said uh, during uh, this event, uh, we always may rely on that uh, fantastic uh, creature, uh, which is the breadth of the law uh, and which uh, is uh, identified with interpretation. Uh, so, having regard, for example, to the presentation by Giancarlo, at least in part, the gender perspective uh, has been fostered, for example, and promoted by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which you relied on by means of interpretation. And uh, the same is true as far as the practice of the UN Agency for uh, refugees uh, mentioned by uh, Chiara is concerned. According to the agency, the peculiar situation of asylum seekers raising gender-related claims uh, always requires uh, specific uh, uh, procedural guarantees to be put in place during the, for example, during the refugee status uh, uh, determination process. For example, women uh, should be interviewed uh, separately uh, without the presence of uh, male family members uh, Clients, uh, as a matter of principle, should have the possibility to choose uh, interviewers and interpreters of the same sex, and so on, and so on, and so on. But again, uh, and I think that's uh, really the, the main point I would like to uh, stress in my uh, concluding uh, remarks, and, uh, I think uh, that uh, national judges uh, uh, may play, should play a fundamental role in uh, uh, this context. And from this point of view, I have to say uh, that uh, the Italian jurisprudence uh, uh, offers uh, uh, a very vital uh, um, example. Uh, the very recent case law concerning, for example, Nigerian women uh, is quite uh, uh, remarkable. Over the last few months, uh, three uh, Italian tribunals, uh, the Tribunal uh, of Bologna, the Tribunal of uh, Genova and the Tribunal of uh, Perugia have passed uh, three very important judgments uh, where uh, the gender element uh, ends up um, having a fundamental uh, role. And so, for example, in one case concerning a victim of uh, trafficking for the purpose of forced uh, prostitution, the competent tribunal, the Tribunal of Bologna in this case, relied on the uh, guidelines uh, 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 which have been uh, uh, relied on by Chiara uh, of the uh, UN Agency for Refugees uh, and affirmed that considering that women and girls are more commonly victims of, uh, victims of trafficking, gender, so this is, uh, I would say, an obiter dictum, so an affirmation which is relevant also outside uh, the case it is true, gender is a relevant element in the uh, determination of the status of refugee. Uh, and this judgment is also important from, from, from another point of view, because uh, uh, from a strictly uh, legal point of view, guidelines uh, are guidelines, so are not binding as a matter of principle, uh, but uh, what is really important is how national judges uh, perceive 
these guidelines. And of course, Italian judges, at least Italian judges, perceive uh, these guidelines uh, as legally binding. On this assumption, the Tribunal of Bologna uh, looked uh, that the applicant was entitled to the refugee status under Article 1A of the 1951 Geneva uh, Convention. Again, in another case, uh, a very recent case, uh, concerning a victim of uh, trafficking for the purpose of false uh, prostitution, uh, the competent tribunal stated that the applicant faced a real risk of re-trafficking if returned uh, to her country of origin, taking into consideration the condition of women in Nigeria uh, who do not enjoy proper protection due to the gender. And also, in this case, the tribunal concluded, uh, concluded that uh, the uh, applicant could be victim, uh, uh, could have been victim of re-trafficking due to her gender and hence that she was entitled uh, to the refugee status. Last but not least, there is another very interesting judgment by the uh, Tribunal of uh, Perugia. This case uh, concerned a, a, a woman, a victim of uh, uh, female uh, genital mutilation. Uh, the tribunal stated uh, that uh, this kind of practice uh, amounts to persecution under Article 1 of the 1951 Geneva Convention and that such acts are gender-related offences, which is to say uh, that women are victims of uh, such violent acts solely because of their gender. Well, in conclusion, so in a nutshell, uh, I would say that the current, uh, uh, let's say, national and international uh, normative uh, framework is, is almost never gender-based, but uh, it has, of course, uh, the potential to be realized from a gender perspective, uh, uh, from a gender-balanced uh, perspective. And let me end my uh, speech uh, by quoting a uh, um, sentence of a, of a famous American uh, uh, feminist and political uh, activist, a sentence which, uh, in my opinion, in its uh, absolute uh, simplicity, ends up uh, being very uh, meaningful and powerful uh, and is quickly tied to the uh, college uh, which the Commonwealth uh, Secretary General relied on in her presentation. Uh, we have begun uh, to raise daughters uh, more like sons, uh, but few have the courage to raise our sons more like our daughters. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to all the participants. Uh, it was really a great pleasure uh, to host you and uh, I really hope uh, there will be further occasions in uh, uh, the future uh, for continuing uh, to discuss about uh, uh, such important topics. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you soon.